All right, we're going to go ahead and dismiss you all to your classes so those both on my left and right can be dismissed quietly. The rest of us, if you would, stand with me and turn to the Gospel of Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2. Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. The Bible reads there in Mark chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. It says, again, he entered into Capernaum after some days, and it was noised that he was in the house. And straightway many were gathered together insomuch that there was no room to receive them. No, not so much as about the door, and he preached the word unto them. And they came, or they come unto him, bringing one sick of the palsy, which was born of four. And when they could not come nigh unto him for the press, they uncovered the roof where he was. And when they had broken it up, they let down the bed wherein the sick of the palsy lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the, sick, unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, why, doth this man, why does this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within, himself, within themselves, he said unto them, why reason ye these things in your heart? Whether is it easier to say to the sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk. But that ye may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. And immediately he arose and took up the bed and went forth before them all insomuch as they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bow before you tonight, thanking you once again to be able to gather here and to be able to sing praises under your high and holy name, just to be able to reflect and think about the precious memories that we have and what you've done in our lives over the years. And Lord, as we sung that song, I just took a walk and a stroll back memory lane and thought about what it was like when I first got saved and thinking about what you've done in my life since then. And Lord Jesus, I'm just thankful tonight and I want to praise you and worship you and magnify your high and holy name because you're a God who's been faithful and a God who's been long-suffering and a God who's been gracious and merciful over the years. And you're worthy of our commitment and our praise. And, and Lord, we just want to, to magnify your high and holy name. And I'm thankful too that when the roll is called up yonder, when the trumpet of the Lord sounds and the dead in Christ raise, Lord, I'm thankful that uh, if I die before that happens, I'll be in that number. But Lord, if it is that I'm alive when that trumpet sounds, I'll be ready to meet him in the air and meet you in the air. <clears throat> and I'm thankful, Lord Jesus, that, that you're alive and that you're working in our hearts and in our lives today. And I ask you to continue to do so during this service. I ask you to have me behind the cross. I ask for a fresh anointing of your spirit to preach. And I pray that you'd help me to do so. Lord, we just love you tonight. And we give you the honor and glory, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. This morning, we talked about <clears throat> the reason that Jesus came forth. Uh, we spoke about <clears throat> where he touched the leper and how that as Jesus was going about doing the work of the Father, doing the different miracles and delivering folks from demonic possession and oppression, that there was the man that was sick with leprosy and could do nothing about it himself. 
and we talked about experiencing why Jesus had came forth, as he said there in verse 38 of chapter 1, talking to his disciples, he said, let us go into the next towns that I may preach there also, for therefore came I forth. And I think about <clears throat> what he, why he came, you know, what, what was the whole purpose, what was the whole significance of Jesus coming forth, and we know why. We know as we go all the way back in the beginning, when man sinned in the Garden of Eden, that there was the promise that one would come forth. There would be one who would come forth that was of the seed of a woman. And we know that that took place as there was a miraculous conception, there was a virgin birth. And I think about Jesus coming forth out of the womb, and then I think about Jesus coming forth um, not too many days after what we're reading. He would go to the cross, he would die, but then he would come forth out of the tomb. But why did he come forth? Why did, it was all about saving lost humanity. And so when I get over here into chapter two, I think about being a part of why Jesus come forth. Not just me being a, a recipient of the grace of, of the Lord Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sin and eternal life, but I think about being for, being part of why he came forth and bringing others to a personal relationship with Jesus. This morning in our Sunday school class, we're in John chapter 12, <clears throat> and we see that there was some, some Greeks that came to Jerusalem during one of the feasts, and they came to worship because they were God-fears. They, they feared the God of the Jews, <clears throat> and they showed up. And when they showed up, they were there about the time where Jesus came forth and, and that of the triumphal entry, and they desired to meet with Jesus. And so they went to Andrew and the Philip, and, and they, they talked to them about meeting Jesus, and Andrew and Philip helped bring them to a place where they could introduce them to Jesus. And Jesus then began to talk about how that he must die because just like the corn of wheat must die so it could produce much fruit, and if he didn't, it would be all by itself. Jesus began to talk about the fact that to bring much fruit, he would have to die. And so he spoke of that. But Andrew and Philip had part in introducing some folks to Jesus. Over here in this passage of Scripture, we have also four individuals that had a friend sick of the palsy, and they desired to bring him to Jesus. And so I think about the significance and the importance of us being the type of people that we're supposed to be that are, are making forth the effort to bring folks to Jesus. Jesus came forth as the word that became flesh, that he might proclaim the gospel, that he might save lost folks. When he died, when he rose again, when he ascended to the right hand of the Father, he sent for this spirit, he birthed the church, and the church is to be a light in a dark world. We're to be ambassadors of Christ. We're to be his voice out here in a foreign land telling people of the message of the gospel of Christ. We have the word of reconciliation according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5 because we have the ministry of reconciliation according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And so in this passage of scripture, I want to see just a few things about introducing people to Jesus, being part of the reason why that Jesus came forth. And so as we look in this passage of scripture, I want to see just a few things. The first thing it says, again, he entered into Capernaum after some days. It was noised that Jesus was in the house. As I think about being a, a, an individual or being a, a people who trust Jesus as their own personal Lord and Savior, and then our responsibility of bringing others to Jesus, I think it's important for us to understand simple principles. Now, don't get me wrong. People don't have to come to a worship service to get saved. In fact, I've never at all tried to persuade somebody to put off receiving Jesus where they were 
so they could show up on a Sunday morning or a Sunday night or a Wednesday night to then come forward during a church service. I've, I've always encouraged folks, if they're at the grocery store, if they're at a ball field or they're at their own home when we go and visit, if God's dealing with their hearts to right then or right there, do business with God because tomorrow may not come for us. And so if God's dealing with our heart, now is the accepted time. Today is a day of salvation. But what I, what I do want us to see is that it's important for us to make sure that we see the need to bring Jesus to where folks are. And what I mean by that is he's in us through the presence and the person of the Holy Spirit of God. And we have a calling to be ambassadors for Christ. And we have the great commission, the authority given by Jesus to us to go out to our Jerusalem, our Judeas, our Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the world, telling people about Jesus. And so here we say, it says that when he entered into Capernaum and he was there for some days, it began to be noised that he was in the house. You know, if we're going to be a part of what Jesus came forth for, and that meaning saving lost people, if we're going to be a part of introducing people to Jesus, bringing them to a place where they can make a decision for themselves to, to trust in him to be saved, Jesus has got to be in the house. We, we've got to bring them to a place in which we are talking to them about Jesus. Do you know what is the church has struggled with over the years? And there's a lot of things that the church has struggled with. But there is one major thing, one major sin that the church has struggled with and why baptismal numbers have declined, why church attendance probably has declined, why there's a lot of decline in the body of Christ, because of the sin of silence. We think because we open the doors and because we turn the lights on that somebody's just automatically going to show up here. Now, every once in a while, that might be the case. You know, you, you remember we had a, <clears throat> it was a Sunday night service, I believe it was. I can't even remember why we were open and, and, and some other folks weren't. My brother Ralph, who's on the road, do you remember what it was? Was it COVID? I couldn't remember. Um, we had choir practice. We, I guess we were getting back to it, and there was choir practice. But anyway, Ralph, who's on the road a lot now, but he, he stopped one Sunday night. He, his, his wife had passed away. She was a, a believer, and God was dealing with his heart, and he was just driving around, and he found a place that was opened up. And it just happened to be here at Victory Baptist Church, in which he stopped. And, and he came in, and he was able to talk with Jamie at that time, and Jamie was able to talk to him about Jesus and and he gave his life to Christ. I mean, that happens sometimes. That happens sometimes that, that folks are searching as God's been dealing with their hearts, but that's not the norm. The norm in the Great Commission is for us to go. The, the, the norm is for us to go out and begin to talk to people about Jesus, sharing what he's done in our lives and what he wants to do in their life. And we have to be active in that. And in this situation, we have that Jesus was there at Capernaum, and it was noise that he was in the house. And just a, a couple of verses down from that, in verse 3, it says, They came unto him, bringing one sick of a palsy, which was born of four. And so we have four friends that had a a similar friend together that was sick of the palsy, and he couldn't do a thing to get to Jesus. And so they were doing what they could to bring him to where Jesus was. Well, folks, that's what we have to do. Uh, now, of course, we're talking about a physical he healing at this point, but it went deeper than that in this passage of Scripture, didn't it? The story showed that Jesus healed the man, but he first forgave the man of his sin. So when I think about being what God wants us to be, we've got to be a people that are actively involved in getting to the point, bringing people to Jesus. We have to bring folks to a point in the discussion of what they're going to do with this man, Jesus. I've said before, we, we have to live in front of folks the gospel, 
but faith cometh by hearing. And so we got to have conversations with them. We have to talk to them and bring them to a place where they have to decide, what am I going to do with Jesus? There's been plenty of times it's not a comfortable situation either. <clears throat> In fact, when you're talking to somebody about Jesus, you can talk about him. You can talk about the cross. You can talk, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you? Yeah, I believe that. Do you believe that he rose from the dead and that he's alive forevermore? Yes, I believe that. Do you understand that we've all sinned, right? We, we a lot of times when we're telling them, we don't always just point the finger. We, we try to make sure that they understand that we all have sinned. We try to talk about being a sinner as, as pleasant as possible, right? I mean, we're all sinners. We try to talk about, yeah, they can admit to that. Nobody's perfect. But how many times do we fall short of bringing people to a place in which they have to be confronted by what they're going to do with Jesus? You know, there have been plenty of times in, in, <clears throat> over the years that, that you almost want to stop because you're afraid. What are you going to do? Are you Are going to run that person off? Is it going to be uncomfortable if they don't want to trust in Jesus? And there's many a times that folks say no to it. But at the end of the day, we have got to be a people that don't stop short and bring people to a place where, where they're going to say either yes to the gospel or no to the gospel. we got to bring them to such a place as that. Jesus was noised to be in the house, and there was a gigantic crowd that was there. There wasn't any room left in the house. You couldn't even barely get to the door. And Jesus was preaching the word unto them. And so we've got to see that in order to be a part of what Jesus came forth for, we've got to get people to a place to where he is at and where his word is being proclaimed. We've got to share with them, folks. I think that's lacking in this world. We, we're not... And I'm not just talking about preaching from the pulpit. I'm talking about when you and I get out of here and we go about our business and we're at our jobs or we're at family functions or we're at the grocery stores or wherever we may be, that we are able to talk about Jesus. Over the last couple of weeks, it's been pretty interesting at work. We've had about Bible study uh, almost daily. And I just let them bring up their own topics. And we'll start talking about what the Bible says. And this guy brings something up. He said, now, <clears throat> I'm going to bring something up. He said, we'll save this for tomorrow. He says, so don't talk about it. But he's, he don't tell me no more because he knows I can't just not talk about it. So if he brings it up, we're going to talk about it. Unless I just don't have no idea about it. And then I might have to go study some on it. But, but anyway, Bible study at work has been awesome. When we've just been able to share from what the scripture says, I've been trying to get them to come to church. They ain't come here yet. So what I do, I bring Jesus to them. We're going to talk about it. We're going to talk about the need to be saved. We're going to talk about the need to live for Christ. We're going to talk about the craziness of this world and how that it's a mess and the darkness of this world and the confusion of this world. But I'm going to try to keep bringing them back to the Lord Jesus Christ, because you know what? He's the only one that makes any sense of this world. He's the only one that can deal with our sin. He's the only one that can change our life. He's the only one that can give us hope. He's the only one that can calm us in the storm or calm the storm that we're in. He is the only one that really makes any type of difference in our life. And in fact, when we look at this, this life and when we start to see it as he sees it, Folks, it makes all the difference in the world, right? And so I say, hey, we got to bring Jesus to them. These individuals here, they got their friend who could not come to Jesus on his own, and they bore him. It took four friends. They ganged up on him, and they did what they could. When they, when they were going to, to, to help be a part of what Jesus was doing, they brought their friend to him. Not only did they bring their friend to them, but they didn't let the obstacles stop them. 
And I think so many times we are so easily to be stopped from what we're supposed to be doing for Jesus. We, we'll, we'll let anything coming and going hinder us from being what we need to be. In this specific situation, we know the crowd was big, right? <clears throat> Verse 2 says that it, the, the whole house was full. There was no room, not even about the door while he was preaching. And so when they got there, they couldn't even get close to him because of the crowd. So what did they do? Of course, houses are a little bit different than today. They was able to get up on the roof, and that wasn't something out of the ordinary. They got up on the roof, and the way the house was made, they were able to start tearing up the roof. And they just made a hole in the roof. And they began then to see where Jesus was, and they started to lower their friend down where he was. So if they couldn't get through the press, they weren't going to just say, we'll come back later. They didn't say, well, must not be the will of God. You know, I tease Paul Terry. He used to say to me, I'll see you Sunday if, it got, if it's God's will. I said, well, it's God's will for you to be here. So I'll see you here. You know, <clears throat> you know, it is the will of God for a lot of things, you know. But anyway, they didn't say, well, it must not be the Lord's will for our friend to get to Jesus because the crowd's too big. We can't get through the press. No, they said this is too much of a serious business. And you know what? They were willing to go ahead and tear up the roof. I think that it's time for us to tear up the roof sometimes. I think it's time for us to get to a place where we realize that, that it's important, so important for us, that we must do what's necessary to get people to a place where they might experience the life-changing work of Jesus personally. We got to do what we got to do. Amen. I mean, they had to tear up the roof to lower down their friend. Well, we may have to change schedules. We may have to make sacrifices. We may have to put forth some extra effort just to make sure that we can be the light or witness that we need to be to who it is that God's put in our path. Living for Jesus ain't easy. Being a light for him isn't always easy. In fact, being what you're supposed to be for Christ and trying to be a witness sometimes can be some of the most discouraging thing that you do. Because you want everybody to come to Jesus. You want your friends, your family, your co-worker, folks you come around that, you, that maybe you don't even know, but <clears throat> you happen to run into them at stores or whatever. And, and the desire is for everybody to be saved. That's what God desires. That's what we should desire. And it would seem that everybody would want their sins forgiven. You would think everybody would want to know that when they died, they would go to heaven. But the reality, folks, is that when we talk talking about sin, that's, that's, I mean, it's a major issue in our lives. When we start talking about repenting and having to turn from our sin, that's an issue that everybody has to deal with. When you start talking about Satan, he is a deceiver. He is a liar. He is as a, a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. He is roaming this world and doing all he can to prevent that. And so when we go out here, sometimes it can be discouraging. You know, I was talking to a friend of mine the other day. And me and him used to go out all the time. We'd, we'd go to the jails. We would <clears throat> share the gospel at the softball fields. We would go out witnessing door to door and uh, when I was his pastor. And so anyway, we were talking just the other day and he said, you know, he said so many times I, I got discouraged because I didn't think we was making a difference. But he said, now, when I start looking back over it, he said, we was able to see quite a bit of people saved. I said, yeah, we did. We've seen a lot of people saved. We've seen a lot of people saved when we went door to door witnessing, knocking on folks' door, going in there and confronting them, talk to them about where they stood with Jesus. Uh, we did that on the ball field, sharing the gospel with those there right in the middle of the night. I remember coming right over here in London, Kentucky, <clears throat> right over here at this old fairgrounds, and they had an all-night tournament. I thought, what in the world am I doing when it come about 5, 6 o'clock in the morning? And I thought I was going to die because I didn't have no sleep. But I thought, what in the world am I doing? But about midnight, 
When I came over here, I didn't come over here with a bunch of Christians either. Me and that guy was a saved person. There probably was one other guy with us that were saved. The rest of the other folks didn't know Christ. And, and I came over, and we didn't drive over with them. So we all got around. This guy pops up a trunk, and he opened that trunk. There's more beer in the back of that trunk than I drunk pop in a month. And I thought, well, I ain't going to hang out with these guys all night. So I didn't hang out. We played some ball, but I didn't really hang out around him. But, but as we were there, there was another fellow there. that We started talking to him, sharing the gospel with him, right there on the tailgate of a truck about midnight, right out there on the ball field. We started really getting down serious about the gospel. And that fellow gave his heart and life to Christ. And my understanding, he's, you know, still living for Jesus, like, you know, when it was, since he got saved. And so whether it's that or whatever, but we got to put forth some effort in telling people about Jesus. You know, we have to be able to not just let the obstacles get in our way. And these four individuals, they, they decided, you know what? We're not going to let the press, we're not going to let the crowd deter us from getting our friend to Jesus. We're not going to let that happen. We're not going to allow the roof to get in our way. We're going to do whatever it takes. You say, well, what about them tearing somebody else's roof up? Well, I guess they just had to fix it afterwards. I don't know. But you know what they were concerned about? Their friend more than everything else. And that's what we have to get. We got to get to a place where we understand what is most important. These folks did. They didn't let the obstacles get in their way. Goes on to say there in verse 5, well, it says there that they broke up that roof. They let down the bed where in the sick of the palsy lay. And verse 5 says, And when Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the one sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, when you read this passage of Scripture, you can say, hold on a second. Did the guy that was sick of the palsy believe? I'm going to say that he believed. But I also think that the faithfulness of the four friends, Jesus honored that. For instance, when you and I pray for somebody, does your prayer save anybody? No, it can't. You, you pray for somebody to be saved, but your personal prayer does not that, that does not make somebody automatically saved, okay? Just like training your child in the ways in which they should go so when they get older, they cannot depart from it. Just because your child was conceived and they were here in, in church, in the nursery, in services, from the time that they were conceived and in, they came into the world as babies, you did all that you can and training them in the way that they should go doesn't guarantee that they will be saved. What it does guarantee is that they'll never be able to, to get away from what you taught them. So you talk about praying, you talk about teaching or training, you do whatever you can. But what I do believe is this, that God honors the faithful who do the work of Christ. When you sow the gospel seed, the Bible says you're not, not to grow weary in well-doing. Why? Because you eventually will sow what you reap. The more that we sow the gospel, the more that we bring people to Jesus and bring them to a place in which they're going to have to make a decision for Jesus, guess what's going to happen? More people are going to get saved. That's just what happens. If you never do, you'll never see anybody saved. But if we continue to share the gospel, if we continue to be intentional with, the, with evangelism and sharing the gospel, then we will see people get saved. And so when Jesus looks up there and he sees the faith of those four and he responds to that, I think he honors them. I think he honors them as they brought their friend, carrying him on the bed. And that's a, that's a big obstacle in and of itself, right? I mean, how many of us would say, well, well the, uh, we like for Jesus to come to our friend because he's bedfast and, but I don't know how in the world we're going to get him there and it's saying going to work, so we'll do what we can to get Jesus here. Well, their friend said, hey, buddy, we're going to go for a ride, so hang on. 
And I could, rem I, I could just think about my grandpa in that situation. You know, it, it, was, it was a similar situation. He wasn't, he wasn't bed fast yet, but he was very close to it before he came to my house. And, and if you all remember, he was sick. He was in one of those rehab facilities, and they was about to make him leave because he wouldn't do the rehab he was supposed to do. and His insurance wouldn't cover it. And I invited him to come to my house, and he wouldn't come. He said, I'm not coming down there. And uh, he said, I, I've got your mom up here and your aunts up here, and they can take care of me. I'm not coming down there. We had a little tent revival out here, and I asked y'all to pray. Whatever it would take that my grandpa might be saved. If that means that he has to come down here to my house, and that means I have to take care of him, then that's what we'll do. And he said no at first, and a week of being at home, he told my mom, he said, you call T and tell him I'll come down. That's what he called me when the time I was little. So, so he came down, and it was a task. It was every single day when I get up and I would change my grandpa and clean him up, and I'd go to work, and I'd come home, and I'd change my grandpa and clean him up, and I'd spend time with him, and I'd try to take care of what the kids are doing, and Julie was helping, and they were helping, and everybody was helping. It was, it was a huge task, and, and as he went down physically, it was harder and harder, and sometimes he was hard to deal with. He's a lost man, and, and he didn't always have the, the, the nicest language, and and when the nurses would come or the therapist would come, he wasn't very nice to them. And, and, I mean, it was tough sometimes. I mean, it was a strain. It was a strain to me and Julie. It was a strain on the kids. But, but, but when we think about getting them, getting him to where Jesus was at, I told Julie, I told the kids, some things just, it's tough, but there's some things that are worth, worth it. And... He got sick, got sicker, got placed in the hospital. I was in the car wreck. God has a way of working things off, things out. I don't, I didn't want to never draw up the plan that way. But being in the car wreck, couldn't go back to work. And so I, I was able to go up there with him in the hospital. And before he went in the hospital, he could tell that it was a little bit tough on us at the house. And he told me one day, he said, he said, T, I think I'm ready to go home. So I'm not going back to Ohio. I said, why, Papa? He said, well, it's hard on you guys. I said, it is. It's tough. But I said, listen, when I was a little baby, my dad didn't want me. And he dropped me and mom off at your house. You didn't say this too tough. You took me in. You took care of me. You took care of the kids that come after me with mom. I live there until I move down on my own. I say, you're my papa. I'm going to do whatever it takes to help take care of you. But, but secondly, and most importantly, papa, I said, I'm going to do what I got to do. I'm not perfect. I said, you, you know that. You know that before you ever came down here that I'm not perfect. But even since I've been saved and trying to live for Jesus, I'm not perfect. And I said, so if we have made you feel like we don't want you here because it's been tough. Maybe me and Julie's fussed and he heard it. Maybe me and the kids, we've heard it. I said, I apologize for that. But I said, I'm going to tell you something. The reason that I do what I do and the reason that we do what we do is because we want you to understand the love of Jesus more than anything else. Because, Papa, if you die without Jesus, you're going to go to hell. And I want you to understand that Jesus loves you. And I may not always be the best at showing it because maybe, like I said, I wore out from time. I mean, wore slick out by the time it's all said and done. When I said, Pat, I want you to get saved. I want you to understand how much Jesus loves you. And if that means I've got to change your diapers, I'm going to change your diapers. If that means that I've got to stay up all night or you've got to wake me up in the middle of the night, I mean, he'd wake me up in the middle of the night, get him Oreo cookies because he didn't know what time of day it was. I'd say, Papa, do you got to have Oreo cookies at 3 o'clock in the morning? You know? And I'd get up and give him Oreo cookies, but, but I want him to know about Jesus. You know what? It's tough. Sometimes things are tough. Just like these friends had 
They had to bear their friend together and they had to get him to, the, to where Jesus was and the crowd was too big. Then they had to go to the roof. I can imagine my grandpa, I, I just want to take him outside for Thanksgiving on a wheelchair. He's panicking. You're going to push me over the mountain. He's used to living up there in the city. We're going to go over the big bluff, he thought. I said, Papa, we're not. We're just going out here and enjoying the outside for a little bit. I can imagine trying to get him up on the roof to tear, out, tear it up, to lower him down before Jesus. But that's what it felt like. I thought there's no way that he would agree to come down here, and he didn't initially. I thought there's no way. I was at a place in my life spiritually that I was already settled with it. I said, Lord, you've been so good to him. And if he dies without you, I'm okay with him. Not that it's not going to be hard, but you've been so faithful. You gave him time after time after time. And he's been hard-headed and stiff-necked, and he said no to you. So if he dies, it's been eternity separated from you. It just is what it is. So I ask for your help not only to be able to deal with that, but also to be able to look at my family when a funeral comes about and tell them the cold, hard truth of where he is because a lot of people, every, it seems like every time somebody dies, they automatically go to heaven. We come up with some, some story to make us think they're in heaven, but I was not going to do that. But while in the hospital, before he died, about two weeks before he died, he came to know Christ. You do what you got to do. We prayed out here. I asked God to do something in, in, in our life, and he did that. And it was tough. It was very tough, you know. But at the same time, it was worth it. When he passed away, it was sad. It was hard because he, he was one of the most important people in my life growing up. But you know what? No regrets over here. No regrets. And I've been gone from from Ohio for many years, and I had not been able to help like some of my other siblings helped. But when the time came in which I was able to do something in the name of Jesus, not just physically for my grandpa, but to bring him to a place where they would have, where he'd hear the gospel. In fact, my sister would tell him, hey, Papa, we're sending you down there to Jesus boot camp. Huh? They thought it was funny. I don't know if he did. And I didn't know really how to take that. But I'm all right with Jesus boot camp because I don't think there's a better place to be, amen? But he come to know Christ. I said all that long story just to say that we got to do what we have to do and God will honor the faithfulness of his people who are a part of why he came forth. When he saw their faith, he said to the son, unto the one sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. Now, I don't know what those fellas expected Jesus to do initially. I'm assuming it had nothing to do with the man's sin be forgiven. I'm going to assume what they wanted was their friend to be healed physically and to be able to get up off his bed. I think that's why they wanted him there initially. We also need to understand that Jesus sees a lot further off than just the physicality of this world. And so, yes, he's a miracle worker. Yes, he is a healer. Yes, he's the great physician. Yes, he can do as we ask him to move in, in ways. And that's great. But ultimately, what he is concerned about is the soul of man. And where do we stand with him in our relationship? And so when Jesus says to him, son, thy sins be forgiven thee, I think it went even way more than what they ever imagined. And that's how Jesus works, isn't it? When we think about trying to live for him, he wants to do things greater than what we can even imagine. We think about doing a work for Christ. We have to keep going forward even when it comes to, when, it ha when we have to overcome the skeptics. Verse 6 says that there were certain of the scribes sitting there reasoning in their hearts, why did this man thus speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God only? 
It says immediately when Jesus perceived in the spirit, they were so reasoned within themselves. He said, why reason you these things in your heart? I love it how Jesus would confront a person about what's in their heart. He says, is it easier to say to this one sick of the palsy, thy sins be forgiven thee, or to say, arise and take up thy bed and walk? He asked the question because the answer is obvious. It's a whole lot easier to say to that man laying on the bed, your sins are forgiven. You know why? Because nobody can see the heart. Nobody is able to say if that really took place or not. You could say whatever you want to, right? It kind of reminds me of how Nebuchadnezzar wanted his dream interpreted, but he wouldn't tell what the dream was. Whether he forgot what the dream was or whether he did know what the dream was, he wasn't going to tell those magicians and astrologers and, and so on and so forth what the dream was because what could they do? They could tell them anything they wanted to. They could come up with any interpretation that they wanted, and he wouldn't know for sure or not that was true. So he said, you're going to tell me what my dream was, and then you're going to tell me an interpretation. And if you're able to tell me what my dream is, I then will know that you have the ability to really interpret it. So when Jesus says, is it easier for me to say, son, thy sins be forgiven thee? Of course it is. Because there was no way to prove if that man's sin was really forgiven. Or he says, or is it easier for me to say, son, arise, take up thy bed and walk. And he said in verse 10, but so you can know that the son of man has power on earth to forgive sins he saith to the sick of the palsy, I say unto thee, arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thy house. This is what's so awesome about being a part of why Jesus came forth. Because you get to be a part of life-changing experiences in people's lives. There, there's no better feeling than being a part of somebody getting saved. You, you can think about yourself getting saved, and that's an awesome experience. But I'm going to tell you, it's a close second being able to talk to somebody about Jesus and experience him working in their life and hearing them cry out to him and watch him do something that changes their life. I mean, it's, it's just an awesome experience. You don't get any more satisfying than that. It's to see somebody forever changed by the grace and the work of Almighty God. And Jesus forgave this man of his sin, and then he physically healed him, and he says to all the skeptics and everybody around, just so you know that I have the authority to forgive sin, I'm going to show you by doing this work. And that's something we need to understand too about all these different miracles and signs that took place then and what we're looking for today a lot of times is those signs, those miracles, those healings, they were there for a purpose and it was there to confirm who Jesus said he was. And so when he said, get up and walk, it was the proof I have the authority to forgive sin. So all the different signs, when you remember when John the Baptist was about to die, he had already seen the dove descend. He baptized Jesus. He even said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. But he was about to die. And as he was about to die, he said, send somebody and ask Jesus one more time. You, you are the one we're supposed to be looking for. Now, people question John the Baptist. They can try to knock him if they want to but he's about to have his head took off. And so he sends forth that question and Jesus comes back and I'm paraphrasing, but he says something like this. Did the blind see? Was the gospel preached to the poor? He just, he says a few things that are in reference to what the Messiah was supposed to be and what he was supposed to do from the Old Testament scriptures. And when John the Baptist hears it, John the Baptist is just affirmed in his heart. 
than, hey, I'm following the right man. I'm going to die for the right man. It's not a problem. <clears throat> My point is, you have these signs that prove who Jesus is. So when we think about God doing the work, you yourself, if you've already trusted him, you know you're saved. You know what he's done in your life, <clears throat> and you know what he wants to do in other people's lives. And so we, we, we talk to folks and have an expectation that he's going to change them, right? And I think that's what we ought to have, and so we can see that. Get up. In verse 12, it says, And immediately he arose, took up the bed, and went forth before them all, insomuch that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, We never saw it on this fashion. Oh, when you get a part, be a part of what Jesus is doing and why he came forth, guess what? You get to be a part of some things that you can't explain other than Jesus done a work. You know, we've never seen it like this before. I mean, over the years, it's been pretty amazing to see people come to know Christ in various situations and circumstances, whether it be on mission trips, whether it be during Bible school, whether it be during preaching in a regular Sunday service, whether it be during some type of revival service, whether it's out there doing some of our pop-up worship services, whether whatever it is, when you go out here and share the gospel, you know, and you see God do work in somebody's life because you've been a part of being obedient to what God calls us to do. Man, that's just an awesome thing. And folks, while we got time, as the Bible says, the field is white. It's ready for harvest. But the laborers are few. We got to get out there on our row. And we got to work our row. We, we got we to gotta do our part. He says that the field is white and ready for harvest. We're not even talking about, you know, we got to plant seed. I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is in that specific passage, it says that. It's like, go out there and get the fruit. Go out there and get the ears of corn. Go get your tomatoes. Go get your beans. You know? And we know how people are today. There's many people that have gardens and, and, and they got more than what they can do themselves and they'll say things like this, well, if you want to come get some beans, just come and get them. And how many times you get people, they won't even show up to your house to get the beans. Huh? And if you'll pull the beans for them and break the beans and string the beans and, and bring them over to the house and put them in a, in a pot and boil them for them and maybe season them up, put a little piece of that, that fat back in there and, and everything, then they might eat some if you... <laughs> You cook it for them. But not only many people getting out there into the, into the garden and getting the harvest, are they? Not a lot, you know. But folks, we got to be a part of why Jesus came forth. We got we to gotta get folks where Jesus is. We, we've got to overcome the obstacles. We, we got to, to trust that God's going to honor our faith, and he will. And we get to be a part of him changing people's lives. God could do whatever he wants to without us, but for whatever reason, his own sovereignty, he has said, I want to do my work through my people. And we're blessed to be able to be a part of that. What about you? I'm going to ask Brother Travis to come and Susie to come as they lead us in a time of invitation and just think about how how that we should desire to be a part of that and what a responsibility we have if we've trusted Jesus as our own personal Lord and Savior to tell someone else about Christ, you know? When's the last time that you were actively involved in doing that? When's the last time that you talked to somebody about their personal relationship with Jesus, if they had one or not? And if they say they do have one, are they living for Christ? And if they don't have one, have you talked to them about how that they can have one and why they need one? And then I ask them point blank, what do you want to do with Jesus? You know? And you won't always understand the answers. You don't have to. What you have to understand is that lost people are lost people, that there's some spiritual issues there that, that you had to overcome too before you got saved. I've talked to people, sometimes my face is blue, and they'll say things like, I know I need to be saved. 
Anything holding you back from giving your life to Christ today? Nothing I can think of. Well, don't you want to ask Jesus to come into your life and commit yourself to, ah, not right now. Why not? Well, what's holding you back? Well, nothing. Well, then why don't you pray and receive Jesus? Not right now. You about want to bang your head against the wall. And it's because you love them and you want to be saved. You may not understand it all. You might leave out there with scratching your head or feel a little bit discouraged, but I'm going to tell you this. You sow the seed, you water the seed, you know. I'm not saying everybody's going to get saved because if that was the case, there'd never be, no hell wouldn't increase herself. But you have a whole lot higher probability of seeing those people get saved. The more you sow the gospel, the more you water the gospel. And you trust God to give the increase. But you got to do our, we got to do our part. Let's pray. Father, we bow before you tonight, thanking you for your word. And I ask that it be a challenge to us. That it be an encouragement to us. And then you'd put people in our hearts and in our minds whom we need to talk to. And Lord, I pray that you'd put them in our path. And I also pray that we would have uh, the courage and we'd also have the desire to see that, hey, whatever sacrifice we need to make to go and tell people about Jesus, that we'd do that. So, Lord, during this invitation, I pray you'd just work in our hearts and we would take heed. Maybe it is that we come to pray for those people you put on our minds. Maybe it's we come to make a commitment to you to be more of a vocal witness. Uh, whatever it is that you've said to us, maybe there's somebody in here that's like the man sick of the palsy. They need to get to Jesus, and you're doing a work in their heart today, and they need to come to you tonight. And be saved. I don't know, as you spoke to our hearts, may we respond to you in faith and obedience. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.